Welcome. I'm Emily Zabin, and I'm the director of the Craft in America Center here in Los Angeles. And on behalf of Craft in America and Textile Arts Los Angeles, I'm thrilled to be hosting this conversation today with Carol Shaw Sutton and Jim Bassler. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation today. Um, I think we are currently live. So this conversation is being recorded. It's being live streamed on Facebook in addition to Zoom and it will live there on Facebook and the recording will eventually be posted on uh, craftinamerica.org and also on Tala's website as well. And today we are going to be discussing with two of the foremost leaders in terms of the Southern California fiber scene the emergence of a, of a really solid um, movement in terms of fiber here in Southern California in the second half of the 20th century and how that's fed into the present. So welcome to everybody attending with us today and thank you again. Um, I'd like to start at the beginning and you certainly both have so much overlap um, over the course of your careers and lives and um, We'll be discussing that today. Uh, two aspects um, to begin. You're both born and raised here in the Los Angeles area. And let's just start from way back at the beginning and some of your earliest fiber memories that kind of planted the seed for you to become makers and then of course teachers as well. But um, let's start with Carol. Um. I was born in at, at Good Samaritan Hospital and uh, lived in West LA. And when I was three, I was burned in my backyard in a in a barbecue accident. And from that point, um, when I was five, I had skin graft, and my mom took me to Bullock's Westwood, where if you bought the yarn, they would teach you how to knit. So at five, I learned how to knit. My mother didn't know how to knit, so I would sort of learn and then teach her. Therefore, my, my um, teaching sort of came early. That was the sweater that I was burned in, and that sweater was made out of wool, and so when the fire hit it, it stopped the fire. And yet my left hand was burned. Um, as you can see, they had to cut off the sweater. But um, that learning to knit, I then kept it up until I even went to college. Um, so that was very influential. And also watching, um, we had a Japanese gardener and he would come and cut out, clean out the ivy and then tie up the ivy with itself. He wouldn't need to go to his truck and get a string. He could use the ivy itself to tie it. And I remember I must've been seven or eight and I just was thrilled by that. I just thought it was so practical and brilliant. So that, that's what I can sort of trace it to, you know, I, all that knitting and untangling of yarn and teaching my mom and you know, sitting forever and knitting and, fin you know, at five years old, finishing a sweater, you know, I had a lot of <laughs> determination, so, yeah. Yes, and so and this was a Bullock's Wilshire. Yes, no, Bullock's Westwood, was... actually. Did I say Wilshire? Yeah, Bullock's Westwood, near UCLA. Okay. So that then also led me to, to, to go into Contempo, that fabulous sort of Danish store, and see, um, or Scandinavian store, and see those Raya rugs hanging on the wall. It was the first time I saw the textile hanging on the wall, actually. And I was thrilled by the texture and the color of those fabulous hairy, you know, fibrous things. And this was uh, when you were a child, this was before college, before? Way before college, yeah. I, I was in elementary school or junior high. My mom and I would love to go shopping together and out to lunch and walk around Westwood. And, you know, so we'd see a lot of things. And we'd also go to Sautel. <laughs> and look in the Japanese stores at those beautiful objects. Um, and across from my high school, there was a place called the Basket Bazaar on Wilshire Boulevard, where it seemed like I would rummage with my mother for hours. And if I'd done something, you know, gotten a good grade or done something, I think I went in junior high actually earlier, I got to pick out a basket. Baskets were always, I was in love with baskets. And I, and I learned how to make baskets and brownies. My brown, our brownie leaders, you know, were into arts and crafts and, and Native Americans. And so um, I learned to do it then. And it, it sort of, it changed my metabolism and helped me cope with the intensity of Los Angeles. It was really a wonderful, peaceful, 
meditative um, process. So. Well, yes, and I think it's important for um, people to know the needs of those individual businesses, shops, galleries, and to recognize how those played into, it seems like, several artists' careers. Um, All right. yeah. And the Egg and I was very influential. Mm -hmm with Edith Wiley. I mean, that was all, that, that's sort of the, you know, all my vague early memories of, of that. Yeah. And then, me, well, I don't, I don't need to go into, should I go into meeting Vera Lee? She was my high school art teacher in 1960, probably 63 or 64. I met her before she was married to Jim, it was Vera Lee Osborne. And that was and that was cool. That was, that was just amazing and wonderful and totally changed my life and my sense of of how creative and, and um, the, the rich visual culture everywhere and, and her love of everything. And she would bring in slides that Jim had taken or photographs that Jim had taken of the back alleys of Los Angeles, which I had always sort of seen as ugly. And by her showing us those in, in terms of pattern and color, it opened up my world to all the visual beauty that's that was everywhere so that was very inspirational and then later in 72 or 73 i was kind of supposed to be the older girl counselor to their program in oaxaca and so at that point i learned about oaxaca yeah we just were looking at an image of you with barely in oaxaca oh, okay. and yeah. uh -huh. panchita uh -huh. yes yeah, so obviously that so there's a connection between the two going back to when you were at University High. Um, and so Jim, yes, would you like to talk about any early um, experiences with Fiber in your life? I know you came to Fiber later um, after, after serving the military and um, but you do seem to have an experience with Fiber from your childhood, including talking about Chaparral in your father's home. Um, I had planned another beginning, but I will go into uh, growing up. I was born in 1933 at the depths of the Depression. Um, and it turned out my father was a major league baseball player. He was a Mennonite, grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the Mennonites and the Amish traded lots of sort of different kind of habits. They were all very good farmers. And dad was a cashier for the Detroit Tigers in the teens and 20s, way before I was born. Then he moved to Cleveland. And um, in the winter time, he would hook rugs, which fascinated me much more than baseball <laughs> and uh, dad they were very traditional and they looked sort of like Amish quilts there was nothing revolutionary about his designs he used wool to punch through into the burlap but he also would collect my my mother's silk stockings and <laughs> have my mother collect all the silk stockings from her girlfriends. And I would watch dad with little pans on the stove, dyeing the silk stockings. Hmm. It became my job to cut them in strips. So huh. it would be punching them into the rugs. And that we're talking about four to five years of age. And it became something that I was fascinated with, the idea of building something or transforming materials. That, that interests me a great deal. I also became quite a farmer because of my dad, because he loved farming. Um, I graduated from Santa Monica High School in 1951. We were winter quarter, 19 February of 51. There were 99 of us in the graduating class, which sort of reflects the, the depression. People simply weren't having babies because life was so difficult. I think that was. Mm. And 
when I went, I went through all through Santa Monica High School. We had wonderful, rich experiences in the arts and crafts, in elementary school and in junior high school. But once we got to high school, the arts sort of disappeared. But I did see that there was a ceramics class offered. This is in my graduating year as a senior. And the counselor immediately called me into her office and said, this will not look good on your record <laughs> that you're taking a ceramics class. And she said, I said, but I want to be an artist. I think I want to be an artist. And she said, no, your grade point average is too high. And there isn't a, she lied to me. She said, there isn't any art major anyway. So through discussion, I became a sociologist and uh, graduated and uh, I needed money. I got a job at Douglas Aircraft Company at a dollar six an hour. We had to work 40 hours, but that gave me the money to go to Santa Monica City College. And I'm, I'm so glad I did because, and this is what I wanted to point out at that particular time. This is only five years after the war was over and the colleges were filled with veterans and how that raised the, the experience of going from a high school to a junior college with veterans who had lived a life we could not believe was amazing to me. And I had my first art history class at Santa Monica. And uh, I took an, oh, we were also told because of the Korean conflict that you probably have three years before you're, you will be uh, subjected to the draft. You'll be drafted in three years. And so in two years, I graduated from Santa Monica and went to UCLA in 53 and was drafted out of UCLA mm -hmm. uh, into, into the army. Um, at this particular- and, and, and Jim, what was, and you were a sociology major at that time at UCLA then? I was a sociology major. Because I was sort of thinking there was a program going on at the time to help reunite families in Europe. And I thought that sounded like kind of a nice thing to do. And uh, had it been Peace Corps, I would have entered the Peace Corps. Um, but I want to also point out that at this particular time, um, just recently I read, uh, reread the obituary of. Uh, Peter Vokas, who was an artist in clay, and it has parallels about weaving. And uh, in the LA Times, written by Christopher Knight, there was this said about Peter Vokas. He removed ceramics from the death grip of good taste, which is what the decorative arts tradition had been. That's from Garth Clark. The, the one problem with Peter Bocas was it was an all men's club. He didn't allow women to be a part of that. And we're talking about, this is in 1950. He was really doing great things downtown LA. And when I thought of that, and I thought of me graduating in 50, and then all of a sudden being drafted, I thought of, well, what was happening in the, in the textile field at that time? And I thought about Sheila Hicks was at Yale. We had um, Ruth Asawa at Black Mountain. We had Ross back at, uh, in Berkeley. Um, we had Annie Albers at Black Mountain. And so you do, we did have people beginning to sort of think in terms of raising the level of textiles from being upholstery into perhaps something more than that, 
not unlike what what uh, Volkes was doing. Um, we also had Lillian Elliott working in the Bay Area, and Olga de Amaral had graduated from Cranbrook, and I thought Joan Austin had gone to Cranbrook. So things were happening, but that could have happened in the 60s, I don't know. It did, yeah. Yeah, let's, yeah, Carol, um, let's talk about, as you mentioned, Joan Austin, um, Jim, we definitely would like to talk about um, your two mentors, essentially, as, as teachers, when both in grad school and undergrad. Um, so if, Carol, you could talk about your experiences studying with Joan, that would be wonderful, um, yeah. San Diego State. I'd like to go back just a little bit to the idea of the GI Bill. Um, and, and Jim was talking about veterans at Santa Monica City College. The GI Bill brought enough money to the, to the university system to allow them to develop these really rich Bauhaus based in a way um, art departments. I don't think there would have been text, there would have been textiles or ceramics or metal without the GI Bill. Um, those programs were able to start and they started in the late 50s and early 60s. So, I mean, there wouldn't have been that opportunity to study at a university. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good thought. Yeah. Yeah. How did, yes. So how did um, both the San Diego State program come to be and the UCLA program come to be? Um, whoever wants to begin. But, but I do want to talk a little bit about UCLA. Sure. Um, I was drafted in 1953. And I can't go over, it would be a three hour program if I went through the trauma of me being drafted and all that happened. I thought I was gonna be sent to Korea, but they sent me to uh, occupy uh, Germany. And I loved being in Germany. And I thought there's gonna be a way that I can stay over here. And I did find a way through a job at Douglas Aircraft to not come back to the United States until 1960. But my wife, Vera Lee, who had been an, um, a hostess for TWA, quit that job, said goodbye to Howard Hughes, and came back and entered the art department in 1956. 1957, Bernard Kester came to the faculty at UCLA. There were quite a few women, again, because of probably World War II, mm -hmm. there were quite a few women on the faculty, but mm -hmm. as they retired, they were, what they did was closed down. Right, right. Uh, the art department was hell-bent to get rid of the crafts at UCLA. We were an impossible class of uh, uh, department of art history, art and design. Nobody speaking to one another, but the art historians were always the chair. So we had book binding. When Mrs. Leckie retired, it, it left that weekend. When Warren Carner uh, stopped jewelry making, that was taken out. So it was really heroic of Bernard to come in and find loom someplace on campus and begin to offer weaving in 1957 or 58. That was the, the, the first time that they were offered. They were not allowed in the art department. We were in the basement of Royce Hall next to the women's uh, bathroom. And, uh, you, the only way I even knew that there was a weaving department was when there was a student show and there were all these real rugs up on the wall. Verily took weaving. Her final was to do upholstery for a piano bench was the final. And also she did a, a folding screen Bernard and Verily got along very, very well because uh, Verily's thoughts about these things were exceptional 
and he really had to take stock about what it was she wanted to do and say. Um, let, yeah, let's let's definitely con come back to Bernard because there's a lot that we want to discuss there. I just want to um, hear a little bit about the Joan Austin um, program and development. Joan, Joan Austin had been a student of Mary Jane Leland at uh, Cal State Long Beach, and Mary Jane Leland, who's brilliant, <laughs> and was able to create a program and and sustain it. Um, and the thing about Long Beach State was that it, it, it modeled itself on the Cranbrook model, which was based on the Bauhaus in that all the arts were to be represented. So we, ha we still have fiber, metal, wood, ceramics is, is major at Cal State Long Beach. And we had a lot of deans and department chairs that were ceramic people. So that sort of helped. And that uh, Cranbrook tie is uh, directly because Mary Jane attended Cranbrook. Yes, yeah, she went to Cranbrook, but also just that idea, that model of what an art school could be, be became a concept at Cal State Long Beach. And so Joan Austin had been raised in Long Beach and her father was a fisherman and she spent many hours out at sea with her father tying nets and, and um, you know, just, just love the natural world and the ocean. And um, she and Mary Jane, you know, created quite a force. But so, so Joan graduated from Cal State Long Beach and went to Cranbrook. And after she graduated from Cranbrook, she came to San Diego State where I had already graduated with a degree in art, ceramics and art education, but I was still making fiber work sort of on the side because that's what I loved. And uh, when she came, I had, that's, that's me with the blonde hair on the left and Joan in the middle and amazing artist, Christine Oatman, who went to Cranbrook with Joan. They were friends from, and we had an, ex, all three of us had an exhibition together in San Diego in 1970. I don't know what that is, five or something like that. So I had graduated from, Cal, from uh, San Diego State in 1972. And I went back in 1974 to get my master's degree where Joan had taken over the program. <clears throat> there really wasn't a fiber program before. You couldn't really major in fiber, but Arlene Fish, who was you know, a very powerful metal figure, influential metal figure, would teach weaving. There were some looms and, um, that, and she wrote a book later on textile techniques in metal. She was, a lot of her current, current work um, is in knitting, knitting with wire. So anyway, I'd had, I'd had Arlene as a teacher and I'd had Martha Longnecker early on, I think when I was 18 at San Diego State. Um, you know, and she's, she was a, um, a student of Bernard Leach and very steeped in Japanese design. And coming from my love of Japanese design, I, you know, I really ate up everything that, that Martha Longnecker was telling us about turning the pot over and the bottom was as important as you know the top and the, the, in, the emptiness of the inside space and the meaning of that and the reverence of the moment of the making. So a lot of that you know, I, I loved from Martha Longnecker and from other professors I had there. But um, when Joan came, um, Joan, I think, I think what was somewhat different about the education at San Diego State than say UCLA was my perception is anyway that Bernard, and I served on a number of graduate committees, so I have a little bit of knowledge about it, but the Bernard was always talking about very large work that could be a commission from a corporation or a hotel, something like that, um, you know, which was good that he was looking out for the future of the students, I suppose. But um, Joan was very much more focused on really intimate objects and a lot of non-loom processes from her fishing um, experience. And she had a connection with Ed Rosbach at um, Berkeley and, um, and she loved nature as I did. So, you know, we would study how the stem of a plant would attach to the blossom or to the, or to the leaf. And we would make drawings of it and we would look at the color of that. And she also had a great library of slides of current fiber artists that she would always show us. And I always remember her favorite word was wonderful. You could just see her whole body wriggle when she saw something. 
that she loved and she would just and but she was you know she was very rigorous and and had strong critiques of your work so I think I always you know wanted to make something that would make her want to go oh that's wonderful and um so she was you know she's she's a dear she died I don't know how many years ago um maybe 15 20 years ago her son's a landscape architect in San Diego Jonathan um, and I, I think she's a bit of an unsung hero, you know, in this, in this movement. Um, and I think in the United States, one of the, one of the beginners of the basket movement, you know, of, of artists taking up the form of the basket and exhibiting it and having it be viewed as something that's valuable. Um, and so, you know, that, that's a huge part of my inspiration. Yeah. Um, it I think it's individual, this really speaks to how several individuals anchored to these school programs really were inspirational to so many artists who um, studied here, continued to work here, moved elsewhere. Um, right. And she struggled. She didn't get much support at San Diego State. She struggled with, with the, you know, with the politics of, this, of the school and, and all of that. So it was difficult for her. Um, but she, I mean, we, we would go on field trips to Claremont and we, there was a wonderful exhibition at LACMA called The Grass Show that had bamboo sculptures and forms and raincoats from all over the world. That was very influential to me and the scale of my work that became installational as well as small scale work. So, um, Mary Callender. Mary Callender yeah, curated that exhibition. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, and sure. I'm sorry. Um, and I apologize, everybody. I'm, we're having some glitch issues with the computer um, that I'm on. But yeah, Jim, would you like to speak um, more about the politics and what Bernard, um, kind of his take um, on fiber at that time in, in your experience as a student? Well, uh, just going on, Verily took uh, Bernard came to UCLA to work in, to be second in command in ceramics, and he was under a very powerful woman, Laura Andresen, who really had control of the department, <laughs> and and it was a very successful program, but they did not pay any attention to Peter Volkis whatsoever, and they went their route. And Bernard, I think, saw that if he was to get a tenure or track or anything like that, that he had to make a name for himself outside of the department. And I think that must have been why he heroically brought these looms in. And um, I came back, uh, I arrived back at UCLA in 1960 at the end of the year. I had left England. Um, uh, Douglas wanted to send me home first class, and I said, no, I don't want to go home that quickly. And I got on a cargo ship from in London that was headed for Long Beach, but it, I went as far as Hong Kong. And I didn't know what I was looking for, but I was looking for happiness. I was looking for something that was going to satisfy my soul. And lo and behold, starting in the different ports that we would go to, I began to zero in on the ethnic people of the world and how the ethnic people, they brought the food to the people, they brought the clothes to the people, they brought the baskets to the people. And I thought, this is what I want to do. And so I, by the time I got to Hong Kong, no, by the time I was in Bombay, I realized that th they had a whole exhibition to the work of Gandhi. And I saw people who were spinning, I saw people who were weaving, and I saw people who were dying. And what they were dying became the clothing of the people who were all around me. And I thought, I wonder if the United States, if capitalism ever allows anything like this, to, to allow 
individuals to do their own thing or whether it has to be sort of run by the companies. And finally got to Hong Kong. I was overwhelmed by what I saw in China and in Japan. And then finally came home, entered UCLA, took a, took a, a surface design class with Madeline Sunkies. And that's where I stayed learning how to patik, how to tie dye, to do all those things that I th saw those ethnic people do. And I was with her, I created everything she wanted me to do was three, three yards long because if it was good, it would go in the student show. And finally, Bernard got a whiff of what I was doing. And he, he finally suggested, he said, why don't you weave that cloth? And I'd been getting around to the idea that maybe I should weave the cloth that I'm doing all this time in because I was doing it on China silk. And um, so I went into his room, which again was in the basement of, it was a utility room. So workmen always had to come in to sort of turn the lights on and off and all that. And I told Bernard, I said, I'm going to weave China silk. He took me over to the cupboard where the silk was and he said, be my guest. And that was it. <laughs> and, and so I started, then I saw what, what the hell I was talking about, China silk. I didn't realize it was 3 billion M's per inch or something. And he taught me how to design a warp. And actually, uh, of all things, I've got the piece here. Oh, fantastic. This, this was my first war with mm. Bernard. He also insisted I do Lino, and somewhere in here is a double weave. But what I learned on this was that if I use synthetic materials, they, they're not dyed by the the acid dyes I was using with the silk. So I learned a great deal from that. And that was my very first warp. And from then on, that's what I did. And, um, and uh, I, I got my uh, teaching degree in 64, barely got hers in 63. And so I started teaching at Emerson Junior High School, ceramics. Barely was teaching ceramics at Uni High. And um, I would, but I would continue to go up to UCLA because I still had my loom up there. And then finally, Bernard suggested one day, why don't we try to see if we can get a master's? And, uh, and his, the only two graduate students were Netta Ali Lali and me. Netta lived in Texas and would take a bus there to take classes with him on the weekends. And, and Netta and I didn't talk much because we, we were so frantic to try to get a, a body of work together to see if it would work. And he said, uh, I'm, he says, I don't guarantee you anything. They could turn you down. And, but we had, we got our graduate shows were in 1968. But prior to that, which was so important, was Bernard gathered up all the shiboris I had done and all the batiks I had done. And he and Mary Jane Leland drove to Garadelli Square in San Francisco and put on a show for American Craft Council that was reviewed beautifully mm. in Craft Horizons. And it spoke about the dimensionality of, of textiles. And Bernard and Mary Jane had devised ways of putting the textiles on malleable pieces of metal that would allow them to bow out and flare out. And so the, all of the work was very, very dimensional. And, and that was, uh, it was a beautiful show. And uh, that was prior to, to us getting our, our uh, degrees. They, 
They allowed us to get our degrees, that is the art history department did, but they would not allow us to show in the gallery. We had to find our own place on campus to show our work. So it, sh you show, it, it, it demonstrated the problems with that faculty. Anyway, so I, I graduated and um, the night of a graduation, we went to a dinner party where we met a woman from Oaxaca who, who uh, offered us her house and business. And from then on, we were headed to move out and move down to Oaxaca. So th that, that ends that, that phase. Okay. We got our masters and yeah. that was it. Well, so you both talked about, you know, partially what I um, was interested in discussing is these aspects to a Southern California fiber scene. Oh, I, know. I forgot to tell you about uh, <laughs> Edith Wiley. He had the Bernard's connection with Edith Wiley and Eudora Moore. Mm -hmm. in, in about 1964, I think was when uh, California Design had a, a big exhibit and they, this is before the Pasadena Art Museum was built. And so the building they could find was the Pacific Asian Museum. And Bernard took his entire weaving class for one week we lived at the Pacific Asian Museum and we were taught how to paint four by eight panels of plywood in Bernard Kester colors. <laughs> and he transformed that museum so there would be walls on which to put the California design objects. And it, I will never forget it. His, his clarity of taking a space and transforming it into something that was, it, it looked like the Bajas. It looked like we were in LACMA when we were there. Mm -hmm. And I had a piece in that show that someone bought. I thought, geez, maybe I can make money off of this, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and Carol, Carol, you saw the California design shows and had mentioned that those were Yes. yes, yes, I was in a couple of them later uh, near in the 70s. Mm -hmm. I was part of them. Um, yes, and Eudora Moore was just such a wonderful, generous person. Um, then she became uh, the head of the National Endowments for the Arts later on. Yeah. Um, and I remember applying the first time, you know, in my 20s and she wrote me back a really wonderful letter saying, just try again. And then I got two or three more after that. So it was, she was very encouraging to young artists, as was Josine Sturrells in Los Angeles at Barnsdale Park. Mm -hmm. I think she's an influential person that I, I haven't, you know, brought up before. But um, she was, there really wasn't a whole lot of contemporary art going on in Los Angeles uh, because there wasn't MoCA hadn't opened yet and the Geffen or, you know, any of those places. Um, and, but she had a space where she really supported young artists. So I, I was able to do a large fiber installation in her space, um, you know, and, and feel like, I mean, I never quite, I, I loved craft. I value the ethos of it and, you know, all of the history of it but I've never felt too bound by the limitations of it. it. It was always a conversation in every fiber conference and you know, the difference between art and craft and sort of the ghettoization that fiber always felt we were in. Um, and I mean, I could feel that politically and probably economically I felt that, but psychologically and emotionally, it didn't, it didn't seem to bother me. I was always interested in artists like Art Provera or you know, there were all kinds of contemporary artists whose work seemed to apply to what we were doing. And, um, you know, Louise Bourgeois, on and on. I mean, there's so many people. But I also think I want to, I also want to mention, I, I don't have a clock, so I'm not sure how the time's going, but there were other programs. It was Cal State Northridge with B. Coleman mm -hmm. and um, Marianne Glantz. Right. They sort of specialized in surface design. I think B was the president of the Surface Design Association. And they built quite a quite a solid program, and and that got axed over the years. With when computers came in and graphic design, I think, took over a lot of the art departments. 
uh, the Cal State art departments. Um, that was during the 70s. That was during, yeah. I mean, they were strong during the 70s. I think the 90s and the 2000s is when the plug started getting pulled on them. Yeah. Um, and Clinton McKenzie at Cal State Fullerton, um, he was known for crochet work, but his students did all different kinds of work. And, I, and then Netta was at Claremont. So Claremont was a center. Mm -hmm. So there's Northridge, UCLA, Claremont, um, Cal State Fullerton, Long Beach State, Cal State, or San Diego. Fullerton. Is that again? Fullerton. Fullerton, yeah, Fullerton, Cal State Fullerton. Um, Cal State LA, I know Connie Utterbach taught there, but what about in the 70s? Do you remember who was there, the 60s and 70s? Jim, was there somebody at Cal State LA? Is there much of a fiber program at Cal State LA? I, I'm not familiar with it at all. Right. Well, LA is kind of long, but. Uh -huh. And LACC was um, where Bernard and Mary Jean were initially as well. So yeah, well, th that, that's a question that I wanted to ask about um, the connectedness of, of the fiber community down here. And yes, it's sprawling, and, but there's also so many programs happening and so many artists working in different places. And how, how did you all stay connected or did it feel unconnected, disconnected? Um. We would often go to conferences and things in the Bay Area, and I think there was always kind of an envy of that, of that sort of politically unified region of Berkeley and Oakland and San Francisco, that LA didn't quite have that because of the, the distances, I think, and, and the, the car culture that we had. Yeah. Uh, but I remember lots and lots of field trips, you know, driving out to Claremont to, to see Lenore Tawney talk or Cal State Fullerton to see a Dominic Damari show or to LA County Museum or, you know, to, you know, we would drive everywhere. The freeway, the traffic wasn't as bad. So I remember taking my students at Cal State Long Beach on field trips where we'd go to the Fowler and the Hammer and LACMA and then downtown LA and Chinatown, and then we drive home. And it was, you know, it, you can't do that now. <laughs> you can't go to that many places in one day. But there was a lot of driving and, you know, we, we stayed in touch that way. I mean, that's the advantage of the internet and all this imagery that we see, but um, Craft Horizons sort of helped connect us. Yeah. And I went to mm -hmm. a number of workshops at the Weaver's yeah. Guild. Yeah. Um, Pat, Pat Hickman reminded me that Berkeley had museum that they that they could go over and look at these textiles. I know the, the anthropological museum at Berkeley was so powerful to yeah. Our right. collection did not come until right. what in the late in the in in the mm -hmm. <laughs> well there was a natural history museum and there was a southwest museum. Yeah, we went the Asia American Museum, but not much else, you know. Yeah. Mm. Well, and yet um, I wonder, well, for both of you, um, now delving more maybe into your work personally, but um, you both reference cultures far beyond Southern California in your work very much. So, and um, so I wonder if if it wasn't so much having the collections here, but your worldview and your experiences that allowed you to draw that in, and maybe there was a certain openness here that didn't exist in other places, if you could both speak to that. If, uh, Jim. Well, I definitely think so. I mean, my, my mother was from a farm in Colorado, and my dad was from Eastern, well, he was born in London, but he's from Eastern European, and he was a historian and she was a psychologist. He was Jewish. He was a great humanitarian. His father had been a Marxist. Anyway, there was this, um, you know, large connection to the world and love and understanding of other cultures. My dad being Jewish, my mother being Christian. So there was this idea that we didn't have to be one thing. You know, we could. And I remember at um, at San Diego State, my favorite art history classes were what they pejoratively would call primitive art classes. And I would see work from New Guinea as fabulous masks and. Africa and South America and, and Polynesia. And that work just seems so vibrant and amazing to me. And so much of it incorporates non-woven textile techniques as part of the skin and the bones of these forms. Um, 
And that's really where, and the architecture of these regions, the thatched roofs and the, and the large scale grain containers and the, 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 the rope bridges in Peru. Um, and those what I found so much more interesting than cathedrals and, and you know, paintings of saints and, and Western art history. So that was just kind of a, kind of a, a, a temperamental attraction to that. And, and the openness of LA during the 60s and 70s and the creative community and music and in my, my study of Buddhism and Taoism and, and um, all world cultures and, and religions um, and, and trying to find a connection between all those. That's kind of what growing up in a Pacific Rim kind of region and growing up at that period of time. You know, I didn't, luckily I didn't grow up, I, during the depression my parents had. So they were always very cautious and worried. Oh, you're gonna be an artist, you know, how are you gonna make a living kind of thing. And I, you know, it was pretty buoyant. I mean, I was born in 1948, but the 50s and 60s, you know, were buoyant besides the McCarthy year and the bomb and all the other things and Vietnam, all that was going on. But there was a sense that you didn't have to worry too much, you know, whatever, if you followed your heart, you know, it would all come to be. And I always felt like if I put the best energy I could into some things, it, it would be seen and appreciated. So I had this uh, exuberant kind of optimistic um, view, luckily, um, that was, it, I, I can't say my parents really supported it, but that was fine because being different from your parents, you know, just fit right in. I mean, you know. So uh, it, it was a great time. And then San Diego was a great relief from the intensity of Los Angeles. I could take that creative spark and determination and drive that I'd gotten in the city and from my parents who were high achievers, um, I could take that to this beautiful natural surroundings of San Diego and, you know, with a kind of support and, um, you know, it just, it could blossom. And early on, right, I think my last year of graduate school, I entered the Young American show and Thanks to um, Mary Jane Leland, who was one of the jurors, and Jacqueline Larson, I won the, the Fiber Young American Award. And that helped, along with Victoria Rivers, she and I were the two Fiber people. And I th think they did that exhibition every five or six years. So it just opened up New York showing and, and other large, large venues and possibilities, which, you know, was like water on a, on a plant, a thirsty plant to me. So mm -hmm. that yeah. was great. Yeah. 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 And I know Bernard Kester served as a bridge largely to American Craft Council activities. So. Right. Right. The American Craft Council and the World Craft Council were very influential in keeping us all connected too. And, you know, and Texel Society of America came and had a conference that Jim and I curated a show at Santa Monica City College um, um, years ago. I can't remember exactly what, when, um, but I, it was titled Santa College at Santa Monica City College. Right. Yeah. Well, there yeah. was another one at, at, at the Egg and I. Or right. We curated another one together. Yeah. yeah. Right. Important institution. How about Jim? Did you feel that same sense of exuberance, or was it different? It's because you were starting out slightly earlier than Carol and coming from a different uh, well, background. And did you see one of the exciting things was when, once we got our teaching credentials, uh, I read, I we or we rented a house at the Venice Beach. Uh, and that's where we lived and that's where we worked and we really loved it. And Verily was beginning to have shows um, at a gallery across the street from Yamaguchi on Sautel Street. And um, uh, she's, she stopped teaching so that she could get pregnant. And, um, and then, uh, I'm trying to think of what happened. We, we adopted Megan. And then right after we adopted Megan, Verily got pregnant. And, and then this whole, and then I got my master's and this, and, and but uh, 
and then this whole thing about Oaxaca came up. But even before that, Verily and I had gone, we took the test for the Peace Corps. We were thinking of Mango, we didn't know how we were gonna do it with children. Um, we went to a Navajo reservation to see if we should be teachers out there. We were really sort of searching for another kind of life, something that maybe wouldn't be in LA. And then when Oaxaca came up, uh, that that fit into everything that we possibly wanted. We we were going to go down to Oaxaca to live forever. We we thought we would never come back, and I'm really sort of sorry we did come back. <laughs> Particularly <laughs> politically speaking. <laughs> um, and um, but I do want to say something that that did happen that really changed um, my career was when in 1972, just when Verily was pregnant with Abigail and when we invited Carol to come down to help us with our summer program, I was invited to go to Cranbrook, well actually to, to Detroit, for a uh, Hand Weavers Association conference, which was huge. And Jack Leonard Larson was gonna be the keynote speaker. And I was to teach a class on ECOT, uh, a workshop, after the conference was over. And I was also to give two or three mini lectures about crafts of Mexico. And all those slides that I'd shown you was included in that. And so I had to leave Beerley with her parents because Abby was still holding off being born. And I flew up and saw Joan. Joan, oh, and we were also in an exhibition. Oh. And Joan was there. Gary Nodell had just taken over Cranbrook. Hmm. And, and he had graduated from Cal State, uh, from, from Cal State Long Beach. Yeah. Gary, Gerhard Nodell. He was one of Mary Jane's students. Yeah. And also, and also Bernard's as an undergrad. He had already taken over of uh, being at Cranbrook. He was right. in Cranbrook. Yeah. And, and in the lectures I gave, two people came up and said, and one was at Rochester Institute of Craft or something like that. He offered me a job, sabbatical replacement which came in really handy because we were able to recruit quite a few girls from that <laughs> area to go to our summer program. And, uh, and then I think Mary Jane also saw the way I worked because I didn't know Mary Jane very well. Oh, you didn't? Oh. And, and so all of a sudden she saw that I, I carried on a very good um, <laughs> uh, class <laughs> of ECOT. And, Two, two years later, she invited me to take over on her sabbatical. So I think those things kind of happened because of that workshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, and oh, and, uh, the, the best part was when Jack Larson gave his lecture, it was on, he, he was putting together a book called The Dyer's Art. And he was showing all of these slides of indigenous people throughout the world. And lo and behold, there's a picture of my work. Uh, and he said, this is a person who lives in Oaxaca. And he apologized profusely. He says, and I don't remember his name. <laughs> and so after the whole thing was over and people clapped and all that, um, I went up and I said, hello, I'm Jim Bassler. You showed my slide don't forget the name <laughs> and, he didn't. and two years later he invited me to be in his show in new york when the book was published and so all of that happened oh but another thing was he was very much like bernard kester i sent it this is in the day when you mail letters and so I'm mailing a letter and showing a picture of what I'm doing. He mails the picture back and he says, no. <laughs> it has to be four times bigger. And I thought, what in the hell? Why are we making it so big? But that, that's Bernard. Mm. 
That's a mm -hmm. great idea. Now they make it 10 feet long. Right, right, right. And, uh, well, that, yeah, as we're um, getting close to the close of the hour and we can continue talking, um, maybe we could start um, talking a little bit more, yes, about cement and scale. I'm sorry. I haven't sung my song yet. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the. Are you ready? <laughs> Um, I also, um, um, well, two things that I wanted to, to mention, um, how we can kind of start to think about uh, what would define Southern California fiber from this, th from this phase, if there's a way to characterize it. And um, I invite both of you to respond to that, and then I'll follow up with another question. Ways that you're talking about dimension and scale, certainly in terms of Bernard, and I wonder if um, there's other defining characteristics of the work coming. Oh, is that a Bernard? <laughs> there's a Bernard. You wanted, this is Bernard, 1961. This is, the, these are the assignments they gave everyone. A footed bowl, a lidded bowl, a pitcher, a cup, and that was about it. That's Excellent. Um, Other defining features of the fiber from this stretch of time that you you guys can describe. In talking about Bernard, hmm? no, the whole um, just the the work in the region during the latter half of the twentieth century. 60s to the 80s. Talking about it right now? Huh? Well, talking about scale and off loom and maybe outside cultural references. I don't know if um, either of you have thoughts about how we can arrive at defining features for Southern California fiber. Um, I think you've both talked about people referencing all kinds of outside cultures. I don't know if that's, if, if maybe the disunity is something that is a characteristic here that everyone was doing their own thing. That's what I think. I think it was very individual. Um, but I also think about, in, I also think about places like Women's House, you know, and, and the beginning of sort of identity politics and political work and feminist work. Um, there was, an influence from um, kind of light and space from UC Irvine. Like I'm thinking about Con uh, um, Utterbach. No, not, yeah, Connie Utterbach and uh, Cornelia Brittenbaugh, kind of these color field yeah. sorts of pieces. And then Fern Jacobs, um, sculptural objects, you know, and, and you Jones. I mentioned her. Say I'm, that? I'm glad you mentioned and Jake is because she was very important at saying, you know. She still is, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. In fact, I believe there's a conversation coming up that Tala is, is um, sponsoring. With Christy Matson, yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. And then there's been this huge influx now of fiber people from the East Coast, um, you know, in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Which I, I submitted a piece, uh, I forget what year it was. I did a, the flag that looked like it was dipped in oil and mm -hmm. I said oil and it was a big piece. It was six by 10 and I submitted it to the Biennale and yeah. like, the Luzon Biennale. And the, mm -hmm. and the I, I won't give the name of the person who was the juror sure. that we do not want to go in this direction. Right. Well, of course, nowadays, that's exactly the direction that textiles are going. Very much so. Very much so. Talking yeah. Queer identity, all kinds. Yeah. Very much about that. And so we're sort of finally reaching a point that Peter Volkus did a long time ago. Yeah, there. Are. I think it's partly Anne Hamilton of influence and, you know, um, there's a number of, of, of people that would... Um, you know, that had a larger art world impact that 
kind of gave us confidence, I think, to, to do that and to, to be aware of that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in, until the last probably 20 years in fiber, probably, you know, from the year 2000 onward, it's become much more about identity and, and uh, polit political statements mm -hmm. than before that. Before, things were quite beautiful. Um, I mean, this, 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 this was a piece that was at the Textile Biennale in Kyoto, Japan, and also in Lausanne, Switzerland. It's called Our Bones Are Made of Stardust, and it's, it's a large basket. I mean, it's 12 feet or 15 feet long by 12 feet high, and it had spiral, uh, you know, it's the idea of a spiral galaxy, and then there's a canoe going through it. And I, and I did projections on it from, um, from uh, observatories of spiral galaxies. But it was from a physicist who said that the carbon in our bones is from stars. And where, where is this piece now, Carol? It's actually in Lausanne, Switzerland. It's part of their collection. I, it's probably, you know, stored in a big box in the back room probably is where it is now. But um, it's in Switzerland. They, they bought it, so. Um, um, I'm going to invite, um, so we're at 102, um, the audience to, um, to post questions in the, the Q&A or the chat. One comment that did come through an observation by Cam Cameron Taylor Brown, um, and we'll talk for a couple more minutes, but um, is that there were so many university programs in that era, the 1960s to 80s phase, um, and now just the one at Cal State Long Beach. Um, we can talk about that a little bit. Well, Cal State LA. Right. Carol, Carol Long at Cal State LA. Right. Um, um, and is there anything at CSUN currently? I don't think so. And there might be a part-time, there might be a part-time class at San Diego State. Maybe Carrie would know that. I'm not sure if there's anything left at San Diego State. Yeah, I have to think. Um, and um, what, how, what that's indicative of the shift that happened. Any comments on that front? Well, I keep thinking about what Carrie and Leslie are doing with Textile Arts LA. You know, it would have been marvelous if Textile Arts LA had existed during that time in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. I don't think we would have felt disconnected. It's really been a link to all of this and it's providing an awful lot of information. Um, you know, the difference in a graduate program or, you know, a major is that you work directly and closely with one professor or maybe two or three professors to develop your work. But I think Textile Arts LA is starting to have critique groups or those sorts of situations where students work can grow or, or practitioners work can grow. But it, it seems like it's, it's sort of a renaissance now. It seems like it's one of the most exciting times. I mean, I'm sort of away from it because I'm up here in Ojai, but when I look at what's being offered, it seems like it's amazing. Um, there isn't like a studio space at a, at a university or the, the group of students working together. And I think at Cal State Long Beach, what was so exciting about our programs and my philosophy and a number of other faculty's philosophy is we try not to be too media limited. Like my program, I think, grew and was able to sustain because we had lots of ceramic people and sculpture people and painting people. And I know at some universities, you know, if you're a painting student, you can't take a fiber class. And at our school, we were able to inter interbreed all of that. Um, so it, it seems like fiber is not so isolated as it was before. That's what it feels like to me in the art world and in, 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 and in the respect for the medium. I, I think that's true. Uh, yeah, that seems like a valid yeah, way to put it. I, I, I don't know. I mean, here I am out in Palm Springs, 87 years mm -hmm. old. But <laughs> you know, I still continue to work and there's still continues to be interest and uh, amazing people still buy occasionally, you know, of course, with the market being what it is now, everything shut down, it's been a, a wee bit slow. I do want to show you uh, how I've resolved or my reaction to Black Lives Matter and 
to the heroic kind of efforts of these young people in the streets, um, this, I'm weaving another flag. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh -huh. there. This is, these are the white stripes. That's Koyuchi from Oaxaca with other little things in it. That's going to be the white stripe. Looks sort of Latino. And these are the red stripes. It looks red there, but it's really, it's dark, it's Guatemalan uh, brown. Mm. So anyway, dark. So that, that is gonna be what, that's what the flag, I'm gonna get a little bit, I want everybody sitting at the table. So I am, oh, here's the one. I'm getting a little bit of red in it so the Puritans will feel comfortable. <laughs> So that's what I'm working on now, and it's wonderful. That's great. Yeah, exciting. And it's beautiful, you know, yeah. as mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. Very exciting. Final words on what you're working on, Carol? Oh, I'm going back and forth between creating these large monsters and then very peaceful work, um, sort of more introverted kind of work. Um, I don't think I sent you any images of, of any of that, but um, I'm, I'm getting ready to do an installation. We're having an outdoor uh, drive around art event in Ojai and I am sewing leaves together that will be outside um, in front of a yoga studio <laughs> with the breeze blowing on it. Ever since moving to Ojai, I find that I look up all the time. Unlike living in LA, I think I was looking, you know, at a lower level. So, I mean, not to sound, you know, like a spiritual Ojai thing, but, you know, the idea of looking up at the sky has been very helpful in the midst of, of this real um, heartbreak <laughs> that's going on in the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to lift spirits, I think. I'm trying to lift my own spirit and I'm trying to lift a community spirit with this. Um, I, I broke my leg six months ago and so I was sort of bedridden at the beginning of the, pan before the pandemic started. So I've had a lot of alone time to think and contemplate <laughs> and, um, you know, trying to deal with what is and my, my son's future and the future of the world and all of, you know, the, the environment and everything that's going on. So yeah, that's, I'm just coping and, um, Mm -hmm. creatively trying to solve those problems. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Lots of material to, to respond to in this day and age. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, um, thank you both so much for this beginning of tracing this history and pulling together um, the bits and pieces, the names, the institutions, the places that really shaped um, what has become a very vibrant community for textiles, fiber art in Southern California. Thank you again to Textile Arts Los Angeles for organizing Textile Month. And um, I think we will close here. Thank you again so much, Jim and Carol. Fantastic to hear Thank all you. the history and your perspective. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope we get to have an exhibition so everybody can see these people's work whose names just flew by and, and what they look like. And I, I think it would be wonderful. Yeah. We need it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Emily. All right. Good luck, everyone. Stay cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Bye. Yeah.